Okay, it is 830. I would like to welcome everyone to today's event. Um, this is something new that we're trying just to keep people informed and add a benefit to the members. We're going to do these, I believe, monthly, and they're going to be under what's brewing. And we're just going to roll through different, in, different things that are impacting the profession. So today we're going to talk about pipeline issues with Tim Baker. Um, I'm excited to have everybody here. Feel free to interact because that's really what this is set up to, to be for is to, to really answer the questions that you might have about what's going on. So, Tim, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I'm a SCA CPA member since 1995, and uh, I am currently an assistant, clinical assistant professor at the University of South Carolina in the Moore School of Business. I focus on accounting information systems, and I get to see a lot of students. Well, that's that's always a plus. Pipeline yeah. and students go together for some reason. They do. Um, and we've we've been throughout the year, probably a year and a half now, um, working with the AICPA and discussing CPA evolution. Um, I know that in South Carolina in general, we face some pipeline issues in normal circumstances. And we're seeing more issues now than we've seen in the past. And that's not just here, that's nationally. There are some trends that are rather concerning, and not just for this profession, but for all the professions. So to start off today, for those of you who aren't familiar with evolution, I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, so that you have an idea of what that is and you know what we're talking about. And then we're going to actually go into the discussion about pipeline. So with that, Whitney, can you put up my first slide? So we're jumping around here. So the AICPA about five years ago started talking to the firms about what they need for an entry level CPA. And I don't think anything on this list is gonna be surprising to folks. I think this has been what the core of the profession is and has been for a very long time. Um, those ideas of critical thinking, professional skepticism, problem solving skills, a base understanding of business and controls. These are all key factors within the profession, but they're also more difficult topics to learn and teach, for example. So what we've seen is through automation, we've removed a lot of the entry level skills that we would normally rely on to keep folks busy for the first year to two years as they learn the profession and they learn firm culture. And what's happened now with that automation is the first year CPA or even the CPA candidate has much higher expectations and is expected to interact with clients much faster. So these skills become more critical earlier in your career. And they're not things that you're going to necessarily learn outside of experience. And when you could take that a little bit further, it's these skills are specific to the culture of each firm. So it maybe isn't something that we can teach, but we can build solutions and foundations to support this so that we can get people there faster. And, and, and I think that's important. The foundational part is very important. Here. And if we look at these six keys here, I think you said two of them, critical thinking and professional judgment and problem solving three, those have been there forever. Um, but in the AICPA and NASBA talking to firms, talking to industry CPAs, talking to students, potential CPAs. What they really found is that, that the exam, as the body of knowledge continued to grow, right? We see three times the number um, of tax rules, laws, and regulations. We see a doubling, right, in audit standards. As we see these things, it has become an exercise in memorization to take the CPA exam. And therefore, the one that memorizes the most wins, right? And that's not really the point. The other thing is that, it, that, that there was a realization that the exam had, had as, it, as it was somewhat stagnant, if you will, in what it was doing, practice continued to get farther and farther away from what the exam was. So this evolution, it's the term evolution, is a time to restart. So we see things like analytics embedded into it. We see topics leaving the exam. And there's a lot of concern from some people in academia about different choices that aren't fully fleshed out yet, but proposals that are made as they're looking at content because they realize that you can only put so much in there. And if we expect to have things like critical thinking on there and professional judgment 
um, and having to analyze data sets rather than pick the best choice, then, then you're obviously going to have to perhaps condense. So the three core sections and then a specialization. Um, so it, it, it is truly, I think, an evolution. Um, there's people on both sides of the, of the fence, but is it a good thing, bad thing? But I think also we need to talk about the effects of evolution, right? Right. So, Whitney, can we take a look at that evolution slide real quick? So, when we look at the CPA evolution, and, and you said this, right, it's still three core tests and then one discipline. So, the exam is still four parts. And there's a lot of people who question that. But the reality is this is a profession with mobility and reciprocity. The statutes in almost every state are based on a four-part exam. So the only way to expand the exam is to create different pathways to success. What's really interesting is we didn't take the engineer's model or a different model. We've said if you pass the three core sections and then the technology discipline, you're still a CPA, which means if you become competent in audit, you can still do audit. So there's no way that we're restricting what CPAs can do based on that discipline, but we're giving them the opportunity to focus in on a specific area. It also remains to be, remains the solution, allows the profession to remain flexible. Because there are a lot of people that come out of school and go into public accounting and transition to industry. It might take on a technology role there and then come back and do government nonprofit work. So we didn't want to limit Right. That's the goal is to not limit anybody with these disciplines, but to allow a path that made sense. Now, there's a lot of discussion about how do you build up from an educational standpoint to support all three of these paths. And I know a lot of our smaller schools are really concerned about that. Um, and I have to applaud the educators in South Carolina because when they got together, they said, well, we might have to create partnerships. We may not have what we need to be all things to all students, but to create those paths between the universities to get people where they go. And I, again, that cooperation that we see within the community is, is really important for the success. You know, there, there are some current concerns about the timeline because the curriculum isn't built out yet. And you mentioned that yes. um, it's really all over the place right now as, we, as everybody has input. Um, and that's a continual effort, but this exam is supposed to go live in January, 2024. And so you've got to tool up to, to educate everybody. You have to get the exam prep materials done. You have to get the exam done. And then what are we going to do with those individuals that have passed two or three sections of the exam? And now there's a new exam. What's, is there going to be a, a crossover window? And there's, there's been a lot of back and forth on that. But what we've seen is as we have these discussions, it always continues to get clear. Uh, and I think over time we'll get there. I, uh, I'm a little concerned about that January 2024 for a number of reasons, um, but getting there is going to be tough. We're looking at, at, at really model curriculum, if you will, questions June of 2022. So that's approximately a year and a half out. Um, lots of questions you had about the, the, the specialization, right? There is a path. So if someone specializes in tax and later they're going to do audit, they can receive that education professionally to make sure that they're competent in that field because that is the requirement. Um, also, we need to think about this. Um, we're already having super student questions. We're already having students say, can I take all three? And the answer is no. But uh, evolution um, will continue to evolve, if you will, <laughs> right? And, but we know it is coming, right? We don't know, you know, right now that that is that, that, is that date certain. But could that shift, could that change? Sure, anything can happen, but we do know it's coming, so we have to be prepared for it. Right, and, and Whitney, if you could move on, this next slide for everybody is gonna show you, there is a ton of information that is ever changing out on the um, evolution of CPA.org website. So whenever you wanna get the, the most recent information, this is a great resource for you to go back out and better understand what we're speaking about. Uh, also, if you're coming to Fall Fest, I will be there, and this will be a big part of the PIU because we're going to get into the details of how we got here and the timeline of where we're going so that everybody understands exactly what the path to CPA looks like post-2024. And I hope to have some input from the exam prep providers and, and folks like that about how they're going to accomplish this goal as well because 
it's going to involve everybody working together to get there. And if we don't do a really good job, it could really cause some cliffs. And we're already seeing some issues in the pipeline. And, and Tim, one of the things I really wanted to get into today, I wanted to, to make people aware of this, but I really want to talk about what's actually the concerns for the profession from an educator standpoint. What are you seeing occurring in the student pipeline where you're at? So we're going to let these slides down so we can see who's online and they can interact with you. Yes. But let's go ahead and just walk through some of your let, let's let's try to make it positive. What are some of the strengths? And then of course the opportunities and the weaknesses and, and, and concerns of the pipeline that you see it. That we see and 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 there's a, a series of events, right? That I see. We've we've had lots of conversations about this. Obviously the evolution is one. We typically when we have an exam change that we might call a minor change compared to evolution, we typically see what we call a bubble, a period where there's a much lower number of students taking an exam. And if that bubble is wide enough or big enough, it can actually cause a blip, right, for that year as they would in a, in a public accounting firm move to a senior and a manager and so forth. And so you can actually have some leadership vacuums as you move along. But more importantly, I think what do we see with, the, with, with current students that are positive? I'm seeing students that are not afraid of technology. Um, previous, a lot of students that wanted to major in accounting, they said, I, I don't like computers, or I want to do tax because I think I don't have to deal with computers. Well, guess what? Everyone is now, right? They're actually understanding and doing concentrations and analytics, taking additional courses. Um, they're interested in advancing themselves in that way. Um, and I do think that given the opportunity, these students can rise to that third year level or fifth year level if they would have been five years ago when they start because they're going to have to do the automation. And I think that's being understood. But I also agree with what you said, education and then training and indoctrination into the way a firm or a company wants its accountants to work is going to be very important. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is perhaps a temporal thing, but it's very large. Right now, there appears to be somewhat of a void with students returning to the classroom, college students returning to the classroom. And it is somewhat concerning in that some of these students perhaps did not go through the recruiting processes that they normally would have. And so now they're trying to figure out how to do that and how to catch up. They're not participating in the organizations of Beta Alpha Psi and NABA and the IMA student chapters and those sorts of things. So that also may create an issue. Um, along with that, we have a challenge. And the challenge is if we think about the pipeline right at the top, let's think about the number of students, and we've got a couple of events there, but let's also think about um, the attractiveness of the accounting profession to students, because right now that is tempering that. And we've always said we want the best of the best in accounting. I think that's always been what we've said. And now they're looking at their opportunities, and, and I've been doing some readings, some reading you introduced me to, like, like the Illinois survey. Um, it's important um, that we understand that right now, money is not the only driver for some, of, for some of our students. They're beginning to look, and I think some of these perceptions have been tempered due to the coronavirus effect. Some students are saying, I don't want to go to Charlotte or New York now. I want to go home to Charleston where I'm near my family. And that's not something that we saw three years ago. And we're also seeing that students are saying they're not as worried about the money. If they need to do 150 hours, they're fine with that. But they're looking at the level of effort. They're also discussing the lifestyle that they want. And unfortunately, for a long time, we've branded it that you're going to work hard in public accounting. We all work hard in public accounting, I believe. If you succeed in whatever you do, you're probably going to work hard, right? I don't think there's anything that's a, a part-time job that pays a million dollars a year, right? But as the, as the students move along, they're looking at other alternatives. They're hearing, hey, I can go start as a supply chain major at $80,000 a year with a four-year degree. That number may be artificially a little bit high, right? But they hear that. And we, for years, have been coming across with the argument that we're told, and even Barry Melanson says we need to be reaching this, that you need to look at the long term for a CPA. You need to look at that long term if you're looking at it from a pay, career satisfaction type of thing. You need to look at that longer term. Those students are beginning to say that's not 
the money is not everything to me. I want balance of life and I want it day one. And so with that, we're seeing a little bit of restriction as students are moving along. And again, we said this may be kind of a temporal thing with the coronavirus, right? And we would we'd assume to pick up. But at the same time, we know that last year, overall in the U.S., college enrollment down about 2.35%. Slightly above that this year, we combined those two, we're almost at a 5% reduction. Um, we've got the coronavirus effect. Then we'll have evolution, and we assume there will be a bubble around that, right? Because we think that only about half of accounting majors in the United States pursue the CPA designation, and that's pursue it. Not all of those are successful or complete through, right? And then we have something that people aren't talking about yet that follows evolution in 2024, and that is called the cliff in 2025. And we see a, a number of students leaving high school that will be at a low that approaches the World War II level, not the post-World War II with the boomers, the pre-World War II level. And so we're going to see a, the number of students, period, the number of young people is going to decline rapidly. And they call it a cliff because it will drop off. And I believe that cliff goes through somewhere around 2032, if I remember correctly. I mean, don't quote me on that date, but I'm thinking it's about a seven-year run or something like that, that there's going to be many fewer students. Therefore, we assume if we think of a funnel the same way we think of the CPA funnel, we're going to think about fewer students entering college. Therefore, probably fewer students that would select accounting, and then therefore fewer students that would select to pursue the CPA designation or any designation is, is some of the reading we're doing because students are now not seeing value in professional designations. Um, so that that is an issue that if we think about the funnel, it's almost like we'll flip it upside down in a way and put the restriction up top that we may have many fewer candidates four firms, four companies that want a CPA in there. So I have two questions. The first question is, would you mind if I adjust these blinds? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I, I don't, I didn't want to disrupt you. And that's, I, the, the sun, it, yeah, the sun, yeah, that way he didn't do that on purpose. Um, oh, that's much better. Thank so, you. So that's my first question. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of, of COVID. You, you brought this up. And when we talk about those types of, of scenarios, You've got to remember, there was a year where nobody could take the exam. Yes. And what we saw is those people aren't coming back because now they're out in the work field and they're getting where they need to go. We also, from the pipeline perspective, are seeing mass retirements because the profession did a great job handling everything. But the continuous tax extensions meant a nonstop tax year. At the same time, you had PPP and all the clients needed to get through that. And obviously, that was a heavy lift. And they just did so much that we see mass retirements. And in the firms, what we're seeing is due to pipeline restrictions in the past, there's not maybe as many Gen Xers in a lot of these firms as you might expect. So you're taking entry candidates or candidates maybe five to seven years and they're, they're running up the partner. Um, and it's gonna be important for those folks because they, they see this as a reward. They, they made it and they made it fast. But they're going to also have to really focus on this pipeline issue if they want to be successful. And maybe they're going to have to create programs inside of their firm and create a firm culture to cultivate their staff to move faster. They need to look at where maybe they felt they weren't given the tools to succeed, even though they made it there, and build those tools. As an association, we've worked really, really hard to keep those retired CPAs as CPAs because they're community leaders, they're mentors. But let's be honest about this. It costs a lot of money to maintain that CPA for a retired person. Yes. Uh, 40 hours of CPA, that's, that's not cheap, right? right? Even if yes. even through our model, it's still, it's on a retirement income can be um, problematic and it's a time commitment. So what we're seeing as an association is they're not just leaving work, they're out. Um, and it used to be, I'm gonna keep my CPA, I'm gonna stay involved, we, most of the, the majority of members that we lost here, it was, I'm retired, I'm not working, and I'm giving up my license. So those inner firm programs are going to be really important with a limited supply. And then the, uh, the other side of this, how do we 
and I'm saying this we, the association, firms, and educators. How do we take advantage of the people who opted out originally of the CPA that maybe have been out in the career in their career for five to eight years? Very, very and bring them back. Very, very good. Very, two points, right? One is being that we that we have heard statistically that in today's environment, when a student reaches 22 years of age, that they are not inclined to pursue the CPA designation. And that is a number that's come down, right? So that, that is one risk. Um, obviously, as you said, the leadership in the firms, um, these people are being pulled up quickly, which means I have to pull others up behind them. But at the same point in time, they're gonna have to deal, you know, every year, recruiting and retention has been one of the major, if not the major issues for firms. It's going to become a hyper velocity. It's a huge issue. And so some firms, I talked with a firm a few weeks ago, um, they're a South Carolina firm and they're like, well, what do we do? We, we can't compete now, but we have to think about, do we have people in South Carolina that perhaps are, 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 did, did not complete their degree that are all over South Carolina? There's about 36,000 people. Um, we have smaller schools that a lot of times have been ignored um, or our HBCUs. We've got a huge number of students that we could pull from. The other thing that I think is being very important, I think some of these firms are going to have to start earlier. And now if young people are deciding, I'm going to go to college here, but I'm going to come back home. Well, maybe those firms need to be reaching out to those students when they're in high school and developing those relationships and the importance of community and working with them. So then they can bring them back in a house and know that they're going to have a home. Because right now I can tell you the students, what they want most of all, they want a sense of belonging and they don't feel like it. I talked with someone yesterday working with freshmen um, and she explained to me something that I did not know. I have the, the, the great fortune to work with junior seniors and, and master students. These students halfway through their junior year in high school went online. And they spent their entire senior year in high school online, and they spent their freshman year in college online. They are now just coming to college, and they're still trying to figure out in November on Monday, they're trying to figure out where their classes are. And so this is a huge thing. Communication skills are diminished. Um, mental, mental health is an issue. Um, we're seeing numbers, no matter what group in the university that has to deal with this sorts of things, we're seeing kind of a, a, a larger a larger thing there. So these students want a sense of belonging, they want somewhere. So we've got to make sure that we continue to reach out and we've got to tell the good message. Um, you know, if it doesn't work anymore that we talk about the long term, and I think the long term is still important, right? The financial stability, the career that you can have as a CPA. But I think we've also got to talk about the firms that, that, that do have a balance of life. And I'm not just talking about where I pop up and I say I have unlimited vacation or whatever, but actually somebody that can say, hey, I've raised my family here. I've done this. Um, you can do this. You can have some flexibility that you might not have in some other other career fields. And I think that's important um, that, that we continue to sell in that way. So that that branding of the profession. I, I will tell you pre-COVID, I would go out to classrooms and I'd travel the entire state and go anywhere I could find students. And I would talk about the CPA and I'd walk into a room and I'd say, how many of you are on the CPA track? And normally it would be about 90% of the folks. I've just started doing these presentations again and it's 5% or less of the folks. And I was in a, a meeting recently and it was a great meeting and I think there was there's huge benefit to it, but there were CFPs, CMAs, um, CFEs and you know CPA. And these accounting students, we had to sell the profession. Now, we're the only licensed profession out of that group because we're, we're regulated in each state. Um, but they all had a story to tell. But the thing that was most interesting to me is they come out of the gate saying, you're, if you don't work for a big four firm, you're not going to be successful. And the quality of life is awful. They directly attack that weakness. And I find myself responding with, well, the big four represent 2% of the profession, not the other 98% are doing some really innovative things to achieve that work-life balance. And I've told the story, no matter what you do, you're going to work hard. But that branding of the profession has to come from the firms. And it has to resonate with those students. We, It's not 
not necessarily just talking to accounting students, it's talking to business students at large because those are the future people who are going to be hiring individuals for corporate finance, for example. And that CPA is the trusted credential. We have to bring that branding back. And I think we've lost a lot of that. Um, we, will see, we will see three bubbles in quick succession. I don't know if we've ever seen that in the profession before. You've got the COVID testing bubble, you're gonna have evolution bubble, you're gonna have the cliff. And if we don't brand properly, and if we don't start working towards those non-traditional CPAs, in my mind, and I, I could be an alarmist, but that's a critical shortage waiting to happen. Absolutely. If we if we look and if we look today, what's going what's going on today is anybody been to a restaurant, right, where they can't hire the workers and they're having to close down certain days of the week, or you've been to a supermarket they can't get the goods because there aren't the truck drivers to get there. What could this shortage, right? If 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 this does, I hope it doesn't, right? But if this does happen in this way and our numbers are down, firms are also going to not only have to rely on technology more. But they may have to look at the amount of limiting the amount of clients that they can accept, right? It it it, it could create a shortage of the availability, um, and and we you know we can talk about price stickiness and things like that. But it's just really a, the firms aren't doing well that are having supply chain issues now, right? Our supply chain is our labor, and so and you look at that labor. What CPA firms are expected to achieve has grown over time continues to grow. And that's why we see evolution. Um, you look at moving into cybersecurity, you look at blockchain, you look at cryptocurrencies. These are these are what I would not call disruptors. They're just the reality of the, the world we live in, but the specialization has to be there. You look at ESG reporting and what that means to investors now, the historical audit, while still important, isn't as quote unquote sexy as the ESG reporting, and it contains financial information. So there's there's got to be a shift in the product line to support some of that as well. Those are all things that are going to require even more skill and more resources. And you combine that with a population shortage and then the profession is going to be critical as we move forward to figure this out. And luckily, we have some smart people online today. Um, we could talk about this for hours, and we have. Yes. Uh, but I think, you know, if anybody wants to provide some input or ask some questions, I'd like to open that up because as Catherine is staring at me, and I know I'm supposed to make this interactive, and I want to make sure we do that. Chris, I will, I'm, I'm Laura Self, and I also teach at the university and in the Bait Office I, faculty advisor. Um, so thank you all for doing this. This has been wonderful. But um, Tim hit the nail on the head with capturing the students. The other thing I want to point out about these students is they came of age during the recession. And so the stability piece to them actually is really important, where maybe people that are 10, 15 years older, that wouldn't have appealed as much. Um, between the community and the stability, that is very appealing to them. So when I tell them when I was still in public accounting, I got raises every year. Yeah, I started in September 2008, so right before the bottom fell out. Um, that's very appealing to, to me. So I think that that's another piece to consider. So a shorter term, the shorter term economic benefit, if you will. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any other questions or input? Do either of you think that the, or feel about the, the profession as a whole know this is coming down and how it'll affect the pipeline and the the new um, CPAs coming into their organizations? I, I'm going to tell you, I've been out to speak with several people. Um, I've actually been in meetings where educators were brought in to discuss curriculum and they didn't know this was coming. Um, this is a very busy profession and a very productive profession. And sometimes it's hard to get your head up. So that's why we're doing these sessions. And we, we really do try to cover this. Um, like I said, at Fall Fest, I'm gonna try even harder, but I believe that there will be individuals, especially CPAs in practice that don't know this is coming and won't know after it happens because they're licensed and they're not watching what licensure does. My goal isn't to make 100% of CPAs understand that it's coming. My goal is to take anybody who is managing firm culture or hiring and helping them understand that it that this is this is here, right? It, it's one thing, a lot of people feel like, well, it's 2024, it's gonna happen. 
for me, this is here because if we don't start creating the change now, we won't have what's required then. Um, so through these sessions and various other things that we do, we're going to continue to tell the story. And if you know people who are in charge of hiring or manage their firm culture or looking at DNI um, um, scenarios inside of their firms where they want to be, get them involved because it's important to do that. From an association standpoint, it's equally as important to create a mechanism that allows the firm partners to communicate directly with the educators. Educators want students to be successful, and that's not just passing the exam. And the educators need to explain to the firm leaders, we're teaching the foundation. You have to have a program structured in your firm to continue that education. And that's not gonna be reviewing leases or whatever it used to be. How are you prepared to do that? Uh, another thing from our perspective is if you look at South Carolina CP requirements, professional development topics are limited to eight hours, but they're also part of what's key for a new CPA to learn. We have to adjust the regulation. So all of these things over the next three years, we have to manage and adjust. Uh, and that's going to be critical. And I hope we can get people to listen, but I know our educators are going to be out and about and Many of them know it's coming and more of them will. People are going to talk about it. Uh, I know firms call the educators because they're looking for people. The educators are going to let them know what is, what's going to take to be successful. And I think that I think that obviously we focused on the recruitment. This now makes retention a very important topic, especially as we have this phenomena. And I don't know how it's affected public accounting or, or corporate accounting with respect to CPAs, but the great resignation, right? So how, how is this affecting firms' ability to keep their existing people? Because that's one thing why we had a pipeline, because we do have turnover as people exit frequently public accounting and go into industry or into government or go into education. We've always had that, that well, if we don't have as much of a bottom end up, we're going to have to work really hard to keep the people we have. They're good people. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Tim, I really want to thank you for coming in today. I, I had fun with this. Uh, for those of you who are online, I hope that you enjoyed it. We'll be doing this monthly on different topics. The next one's going to be on legislative issues. If you want to know more about um, evolution, I'm going to do the PIU at Fall Fest. I would really love for people to attend live. I'm probably going to record that after the fact so that it's in our video archive so that people can watch it there. And we might run that for credit sometime after the first of the year as well. So we're going to continue to talk about this, um, but it's got to be a conversation way beyond evolution. There are just too many external factors out there uh, that are going to impact us. And looking at the next 10 years, we've got to, we've got to, through our community build what that that 360 solution looks like and that's going to be a hard lift but hopefully we can get there thank you everyone thank you have a great day now <laughs>